it as we go. There you go, fab, brilliant. So without further ado, this session will be about an hour. So we will aim to wrap up by about half past 10. Um, and we're going to be looking at sales and marketing alignment. So we're going to look at how to get marketing and sales working together um, to generate more more leads. So really, there'll be a number of elements in here that are perhaps that little bit more kind of B2B or applicable in a B2B context. But obviously, if you are working B2C as well, there'll be a number of areas here that will obviously kind of cross over, especially in terms of that B2C sales. Um, if indeed you have a small sales function or a, even a large sales team, and you're looking to align that with, with marketing as well, because the biggest problem often is how we get these two things working in synergy. Often, um, you know, we, we, we put a lot of effort into one one and the other one just isn't working in tandem with it. So um, let's talk a little bit about, about how to get those two things aligned. So my name's Dan Jenkins. Um, I'm a strategic marketing manager here at Wagada. Um, I think I know most of you in the room, um, but as I say, don't hesitate to reach out by email or get me on LinkedIn if you have any questions after this. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, feel free to pop your details in the chat. I can see they've started to come through now, so don't hesitate to pop your details in there if, if you want to reach out and connect to other people in the, in the session as well. Um, but, you know, it's not all about me. I'm part of a fantastic um, uh, growing team of specialists across St Albans and Hertfordshire, uh, covering everything from PPC to paid social media, Google ads, but we still very much have that key um, specialism in sort of search engine optimization and technical SEO. But as HubSpot partners as well now, um, we're big advocates in terms of kind of B2B marketing and in particular B2B marketing and, and sales alignment um, as well. Um, so a sales focus versus a customer focus, what's the difference? Now, the most interesting thing about this is that a number of businesses, um, it's a trend where a number of businesses will sometimes begin with a particularly strong sales focus, and they focus very heavily on return and investment from a sales perspective. Either they've come at business from a sales background or they've naturally developed a sales team that have gone out there and, and sort of prospected and you know, found um, customers and uh, potential customers and generated business um, you know, as, as a result of that. Unfortunately, though, the knock on effect can sometimes then be that sort of customer engagement, customer satisfaction, customer communications and all of that other stuff completely goes kind of by the wayside. And actually, it can leave a business being a little bit too internally focused. OK, it's focused too much on the end goal and the business and lead generation and the profit margins and so on and so forth. And it forgets about why it went into business in the first place, which is in order to satisfy those customers, you know, to create sort of um, customer value. And sometimes we then need to build from that and start to introduce marketing tactics either for the first time or really build on our marketing in order to support that sales, that sales um, effort. So market orientation focuses entirely, I actually love this quote, that's why I popped it in there, and I'll, I'll pop the link in when you, when you get the deck sent across, but market orientation focuses entirely on satisfying your customers' wants and needs, and sales orientation focuses solely on making the best products and services and selling them with aggressive um, sales tactics, okay? And sometimes the biggest challenge as well is if you're a marketer or a marketer within um, an organization. Sometimes there's a whole kind of internal sales piece as well, where you need to get key stakeholders, um, business owners, sales managers, sales directors, fully on board with marketing. You almost need to sell that internally to say, look, you know, marketing is going to benefit us in this area, this area, and this area, in order for it to be more widely accepted within the company, especially if that company has a traditional sales um, focus. Because not always, but sometimes, it looks a little bit like this and it is just purely chasing that dollar okay and um approaching business from that angle whereas really we want to get it looking a little bit more like this okay we need to have these two teams and these two departments working um sort of far more in um in collaboration with with one another and this is not just a problem with large businesses. This is not just a problem where you have a sales team of 10 or 20 and a, and a marketing team of 10 or 15 or whatever. It's an issue even if you're a startup or an SME and you've got an individual salesperson and an individual marketer and actually not looking at these tactics in isolation, but bringing them together. 
So um, LinkedIn did a lovely bit of research about when sales and, and marketing um, uh, works together. And it used this lovely power couple analogy. I love this. So Barack and Michelle Obama, Marie and Pierre Curie, Bill and Melinda Gates. So, you know, what do these pairings um, have in common? Separately, their impact is impressive. But together, these power couples are completely unstoppable. Um, so they found that when marketing and sales is working in tandem with one another, um, there was the potential for 208% increase in revenue now what we're going to talk about in a moment is how we're not just talking about prospecting and lead generation and how to initially get those sales for the sales team it's about post sale as well okay so a big proportion of that revenue generation in that example from research will come from the positive impact of marketing after the point of sale. So it's not just about generating leads and converting them. It's about creating positive customer value after that point. And that's so often where it falls, okay? After that point, so that you're continuing to feed that cycle or feed that funnel and in turn, generate more leads for the sales team, okay? So when we're talking about all the tactics and things in this, in this session, I don't want us to just think about lead generation for a cold audience. I don't just want us to think about going, well, how is my marketing going to get me in front of more people and do X, Y, Z? It's going to be about how my marketing creates effective customer value after the point of sale so that I'm refeeding the process so that I'm giving more back to that sales team six months down the line, eight months down the line, 12 months down the line from a successful um, sale. Businesses were 67% better at closing deals. Well, why is that? It's because they're armed with more collateral. They're armed with more stuff. Okay, it's a horrible word, but it, let's put it nice and simple. They've got more stuff, more lovely marketing stuff to be able to provide their um, prospects with and those that they're speaking with. And we're going to go on to that in a little bit more detail. Um, obviously, all of this lines up to a 54% boost in financial performance. But the big one for me on this is the bottom one that over half, there was a report of increased productivity. So, so often we hear that with a lot of marketing tactics, we think, well, we haven't got the time. Oh, we haven't got the time for that. Let's just look at, you know, direct marketing and blah, blah, blah. And, and, and you know, let's sales and where we, what am I spending? If I spend this amount, what will I get back? But interestingly, if you get your marketing working in synergy with sales and the two are working more collaboratively, you can see that increase in productivity. And again, I would suggest that's because you're arming your sales team with more collateral, more marketing collateral, and also warmed up leads, leads that are being warmed up through that customer value that you're creating through your marketing and not just from a sales um, process from that initial knock on the door or, or piece of LinkedIn outreach. So it's about the customer and this is where we're going with this, okay? So again, just to finish up on this, 67% of customers said that sales marketing collaboration meant a clearer understanding of the customer, okay? So by working together and using this marketing insight, they began to understand their audience better. That in turn helped sales. So can we think a little bit about how our sales team or sales individuals can be learning from marketing to better inform how they're engaging with that target audience? Because target audiences are changing. And sometimes your target demographic will have changed from prior from when the business was first set up or first established, the type of people that might be engaging with you and purchasing with you may have changed, but the sales team may be getting out of touch with that. Okay. And it's very easy to get stuck into a kind of a, a rut or a sales rut, or, you know, those periods where you get that monkey on your back and you go, oh, I just need to make a sale. I need to convert a customer and you haven't done it for three months or something. And, and then the pressures come. And very quickly, you can become out of touch with the audience. You can learn so much from marketing, from marketing analytics, from marketing insight, you know, from Google Analytics as to the age demographic, the platforms, how and where and when they're engaging with our, with our brand, the social media engagement. Who is it that's liking, commenting and sharing? What are their profiles? So more and more, we can be utilizing our marketing learning and our marketing understanding to better understand the customer and the changes in that landscape. 65% were better at implementing that feedback to then improve the customer experience. Well, you know, why, why wouldn't you? You know, because it's there, the data's there for you. Um, and ultimately it became 
stronger at collecting feedback from customers. Now, this is a really, really key marketing tactic that will empower and enable a sales team, this bottom one here, collecting feedback from customers. Um, harnessing that feedback is going to be vitally important. And it's amazing how many people I work with or brands that I work with that say, oh, do you know what? We haven't done a customer survey in years. And you think, well, look how much has changed in that time in five, seven, 10 years. We need to be thinking about introducing more opportunities to harness feedback. And we can do that through automation, through email marketing. We can be, you know, sending out those messages to get people to leave us those lovely trust pilot reviews or those Google My Business reviews. But beyond that, consider those anonymous survey opportunities, you know, things like SurveyMonkey, those times where, you know, after a certain period of time from that lead generation or sale, do we go in with that feedback request and can really consider when that should be? Because there's not necessarily any point in reaching out to people that, you know, converted and, um, you know, perhaps a one time usage, a service or a product. And it was two years prior, you know, and likewise, we don't want to be sending it the day after we've converted somebody. We need to really consider when we're doing that, when we're looking for that audience feedback, because it's going to be so valuable in informing our processes um, moving forward. And again, if that's all marketing. It's all about creating customer value and how you market your brand and develop um, your communications and service offering. So I'm gonna chat a little bit about funnels because I often talk about funnels, but I wanna introduce one that I don't think I've really spoken about in, in kind of webinars before, but um, ultimately where we're going with this is that you need to, and we're gonna see it in practice in a moment with some, with some other brands, but if you have a sales function and a marketing function or a sales, focus and a marketing focus, it's potentially more important than in any other business setup to decide upon a form of funnel or process for your brand, okay? Now, it's important anyway from a marketing perspective, but why I say this is because it's going to help us get these two departments working more in, in tandem. So I often talk about the AIDA model from a marketing perspective, personally, because it's, it's my favorite, because it's, it's incredibly simple um, and applies in most contexts. But it's the concept of kind of, you know, the awareness stage where we build awareness as a consumer of a need or a want. Then we develop an interest in what it is and we start researching. Then through high quality content communications, sales, we start to develop a, a desire. And then ultimately we have that action, which is that which is that conversion. Um, what's missing from this though, is the cyclical approach, the fact that it brings it back around, okay? And this is where your marketing is gonna be so key in terms of that customer, customer value. So I wanna share this lovely one with you, which if you've got a sales and marketing setup, you need to start applying something like this to decide what's doing what and at what point, okay? Rather than the two of them just working in complete isolation, you need to look at a funnel like this and bring them all in at those various points because they're both gonna be used together or interchangeably. So you always start from a place of planning. So initially you need to have that plan to go, you know, what are my goals? What's my strategy? Where, where am I going with all this? Then comes reach, okay? So that's the getting out there and reaching um, the target demographic. Now what's quite nice in this screenshot from Smart Insights, which is a fantastic marketing platform um, is, is consider there a lot of your marketing activity, okay? And a lot of your organic marketing activity, that's your PR, your case studies, you know, your SEO, your keyword rankings, your uh, social media reach, all that lovely marketing work that's gonna go on in the background to really start to build that brand awareness amongst the wider, the wider audience. But then we reach the act stage, which is key in decision-making. Okay, now that is when I would say that actually the two need to really start working together. Okay, now I was working with a client who had um, some lovely marketing content, actually. It was like it was a downloadable asset, a fantastic downloadable asset. And yet when we started talking about it, 
they'd accidentally effectively placed it in the wrong part of the funnel. And it wasn't effective because it wasn't going to people with the right thought process, the right mindset of where they're at. So we literally took a funnel and said, well, actually, this shouldn't be distributed in this way and here. It needs to be distributed in this way and here. And we've totally changed how we're delivering and who we're giving that, that, that piece of collateral to. Now, that decision-making period is where we can start to really bring it all together. So marketing assets, collateral and lead magnets, but that are working in tandem with sales that are being delivered to people through LinkedIn and through communications and actually having the two really working in sync. What you then may find is that that conversion stage that comes next may be very heavily sales-focused. OK, so at that point, perhaps the marketing activity is no longer of value at that point. It's not being implemented. However, it's had a key part in the relationship building to that point. Now, from that point, potentially, you've got salespeople on the phone, OK, in communication um, and we're converting. Beyond there, though, is where in a sales focused business, we are falling by the wayside. And that is our engagement piece. That is the post lead gen and post sale um, uh, piece. Because that engagement is everything that comes afterwards. All the lovely automated email marketing, the monthly check-ins. We, we know things like newsletters. But the post seller, the, um, sorry, the post purchase process. And you need to identify what that looks like. So you need to almost, even with a pen and paper, get that down on paper to go, well, actually, the moment somebody's bought this product or the moment somebody's bought this service, what really comes next? What comes after two weeks? What comes after four weeks? What comes after six weeks? And start to work that in. Some of that will be marketing such as, as I mentioned, those automated, you know, email processes, offers, retention schemes, things that might be sent out afterwards. But think as well about the sales angle. Is there that opportunity for over the telephone, you know, for touching base? How much do we value those leads? Do we call them a month later to just be present to say, just let you know, we're here. By the way, have you checked this out? And did you know that we have a fantastic round the clock customer service team that are going to be here to help? Oh, and then, you know, in that moment, you start to be able to open up those conversations and take that down a different route as to whether that's going to enter into referral opportunities or new business. It's that whole engagement piece that's going to enable you to refeed, to introduce you to a new audience. I've worked on, on, on campaigns where we've looked as well at the marketing campaign to generate those cold customers, but then how that feeds into a whole second campaign, which is purely focused on re-engagement, referral, and generating new business. And it ends up looking in this lovely um, uh, sort of cyclical concept of attracting and engaging and delighting and pushing all these things through so that we keep this constant cycle of growth. Okay, now this is from HubSpot, but we turn strangers into prospects, into customers. They become the promoters. Let them do the work for you. Let them become productive by increasing that word of mouth, that brand um, sort of affirmation and all that referral, that lovely referral stuff um, that comes afterwards as well. So HubSpot says in that example that the amount of energy or momentum that that flywheel contains depends on three things. How fast you spin it how much friction there is, and how big it is. So all that means is how much are you feeding this cyclical process? Yeah, how much are you pumping in so that you get the reward? Because the more that you pump into that process and time, you need to give it time, six months, eight months, 12 months, the more that you feed into that, the more that you're going to, um, to see back. But what's the goal of your flywheel or, or, or your funnel? Now, with, you know, it's unlikely that people will buy from you instantly, so you need to warm up your customers to start to build a relationship. That's marketing. Marketing and sales is all about maintaining that relationship, and then sales is developing that relationship into business. So with all of these tactics, think a little bit about how we can be more direct, about how we can target more specifically than broad marketing messaging. Okay, the 1950s, that whole kind of Mad Men world and so on was notorious for what was called kind of mass marketing. It was the age of mass advertising. It was about big spend. It was about big budget and um, kind of blowing a lot really in terms of just getting that out there and seeing what comes in.
we need to start thinking a little bit more specifically. We need to start working with sales to harness email addresses, lead information, customer profiling, excuse me, to be able to build collateral that is then going to specifically speak to either industry verticals, business types, business sizes. Okay. So what those segments might look like for you are going to really, really vary. But from my experience, we're very good at segmenting in B2C. What I see is that we're very good at saying, well, we've got, you know, mums aged between 35 and 50. We, we, we target grandsons aged between 18 and 25 or what, you know, and they're into this and they have these lifestyle habits and they buy this. But we're not very good at segmenting further in B2B brands. And we need to think a little bit more about industry verticals, um, decision making units, which I'll come on to in a moment. But how we can then build out that marketing material to speak more to the specifics rather than just broadly who we service and and what we do uh, and so and that, you know and that's account based marketing but it's about getting a targeted message to a particular individual in a certain company and in the right vertical so coming away from that sort of um that mass marketing approach it's the concept of one to one rather than kind of one to many it's about spending more time up front to do all of that specifics than sending out the mass message. And obviously that can be of more value if a lead is of a higher value to you. If the revenue is strong, if you don't turn over a huge amount of leads on an annual basis, you can then afford to focus more and more um, with what you're developing to those, to those individuals and those individual businesses or industry verticals. So let's learn a little bit from other brands because the proof, um, you know, the proof is in the pudding and it works. So let's look a little bit at how some other businesses have taken some tactics to better integrate marketing and sales um, and how they go about it in order to achieve to achieve stronger results. Because initially you're going to need to set clear business objectives, clear marketing objectives and differentiate and interlink. So let's have a little look at how that's done. I've put a lovely link through here as well, where you can see how eight brands have mastered kind of marketing um, and sales alignment, because it's some fantastic case studies. I urge you to have a look. It's what is it, a six minute read, but it'll give you some fantastic insight in terms of um, how to more effectively implement that, that kind of synergy or, or what this really looks like in, in practice. Now then, this... Um, this lovely brand, I, I put this in because I actually think that's a gorgeous um, image, actually. It's really, really clever. That's their kind of main sort of homepage, um, homepage image. A brand called Outreach said that you need to decide not to have a blame game mindset or culture. When pipeline is viewed as a share challenge, then it becomes easier to talk about what needs to be done to improve the situation. Sales and marketing is a complex relationship and assigning blame narrows your ability to create needle moving solutions. If there's one thing that we take away from today, it's actually this, and it's a much more holistic thing. Um, but I've worked with a number of different marketers over the last few years in different kind of contexts. And I remember as well when I was training, because I was working with a number of marketers from very different types of organizations. So it was fascinating to work with people that were in a more corporate kind of background as well. And the problem that they felt is that they, uh, is that they were working with individuals who saw the sales team as literally all they did was kind of sit back and uh, sorry they worked with salespeople who believed that all the marketing team did was sit back and, and 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 sort of do their nails and that was the mentality within that organization and it made me so angry to kind of to learn that that is how um how they were perceived and how that marketing team was perceived within the organization when i knew all the work that that particular individual was was putting into it as well now, the interesting thing in that is, is that mindset the fault of the sales team? Is it the fault of the marketing team? I'd sooner say it's the fault of the organization and its setup and the culture in which it's created so that that is how these departments uh, feel about one another. Because what will then come is blame. So that when the sales team 
um, and not generating leads, the marketing team are sat there going, well, that sales team are doing nothing. We're giving them all this stuff. We're putting all our effort in. Can they not convert? Can they not close? And then meanwhile, you've got the sales team breathing down the neck of the marketing team going, you know, I I've been out selling for the last three months and nobody's converting. What's going on on our Facebook channels and our social media? And believe me, I've heard of this as well, where I know that marketers are literally getting it down the phone from salespeople who they've got no professional relationship with because the sales team are not converting or not getting enough lead gen. And the biggest problem in all of that is that they're not working in synergy enough. So the first thing that you have to do is completely remove any blame. You have to see it as one umbrella department. The two are working so closely together that we cannot enable there to be that competition or that competitive edge between marketing and sales or that they have separate um, overarching goals. They need to have the same overarching of goal but built with their own unique objectives. I hope that makes sense, but it, it's, a, it's a more holistic thing, but it, it's amazing how important that is in order to get the two working, working together and generate more leads. Um, another brand that have, that have really effectively implemented this, this kind of alignment is this company here, Super Office. Now, what they did was ask its sales reps to become more active on social media. And this is something that is dramatically lacking across a number of sales teams and sales focused organizations is social media implementation from the sales team. OK, they don't see it as part of their job. They go, well, that, that's marketing. I let the marketers do that. But in particular, from a B2B perspective, LinkedIn is going to be really, really key in terms of thought leadership. And it's replacing a lot of that face to face stuff that sales teams were able to do um, previously. But in this example, the results are that they saw an increase in business leads by 168%, an increase in social media visits to Super Office's website by 61%, and a business revenue increase of 10% within the first 12 months with plenty more um, room to grow. Now, the biggest thing here is that it's going to be the responsibility of the marketer or the marketing department to encourage and get the sales teams more active on social media media but what i hear a lot of is oh we're telling them all the time oh we're telling them to update their linkedin profiles and they're not doing it and you know uh, sales they're, they're quite old-fashioned they've been in the business for the last 40 years nothing's changed and you know they, they don't really they're not really on board with with linkedin and i often hear kind of you know marketers or marketing departments say that and again there's no criticism of that because um those marketers are, you know, rushed off their feet. They've got their own kind of marketing broad sort of company um, things that they need to be looking at. But what we do need to start doing is make sure that we're actually equipping our salespeople with the training, the development, the learning and the understanding to enable them to be more efficient and more effective across um, social media channels. That's one part of it. The other part is key in actually getting their buy in, like getting their understanding and their buy in that this is going to be effective for them. And sometimes that's going to be challenging as well. But then it's the responsibility of the marketer or the marketing department to really effectively sell, to sell internally to their directors, to their bosses, to their sales teams, why they need to get more on board with social media, social media implementation themselves. And in particular, if you're B2B and looking at lead gen, that's going to really start from, um, from LinkedIn. Uh, what I did here as well, just I thought it was really interesting in terms of these, these numbers, is showed how actually the crossover is there. So those results, I broke them down so that you've got that marketing and sales objective could be to increase business leads by 168%. You know, that's marketing and sales. Perhaps the marketing objective was purely to increase social media visits to the website by 61%. You know, that's a heavy marketing objective. It's a soft goal. It's a midpoint goal. But then perhaps your ultimate sales objective is that business revenue increase you know are our sales team closing enough deals and in this instance yes you know they had that 10 percent growth within the first um within the first uh 12 months so empower your sales team to develop a strong individual identity so that they are key brand ambassadors um, and just finally on this, because I think when you see it in practice is the best way to understand how we can start to implement these things together. Um, Dave Stout, somebody at Blue Lead, said that our ability to maintain alignment between marketing and sales comes down to three elements, process, 
communication and shared ecosystems. We collaboratively, that word collaboratively, create processes that we share and refine together. For example, marketing will help us create sales content. Our sales team refines those content assets over time and shares the results. This ongoing communication about what's working and what is not working is vital. Notice the middle piece here. So that I've mentioned about developing collateral and content don't just let it begin and end with marketing. It's about how the sales team can improve on that as well and actually have an input. Perhaps they're part of the review or the sign-off process so that they have those final decisions on what those brochures, guides, pamphlets, PDFs, digital assets, what they all look like so that ultimately they are also armed with what they need to go out and do their job effectively. And at the Christmas party, they'll buy the whole marketing team around because they beat all their goals and achieved their massive bonus at Christmas because they were so much more effective in sales because they were armed to the teeth with all that lovely marketing collateral and the kind of marketing collateral that they needed to get the sale. So what are the, the, the most um, easily accessible tactics when we're looking to align these two things? Well, the first is lead magnets. So it's a phrase I talk about a lot, lead magnets. But what that really is, is putting content behind a gateway so that you can generate an email address, a piece of engagement, um, you know, um, a, a sign up. Sometimes those are as simple as a newsletter, but I'm seeing more and more, I can't stress this enough, more and more success now when working with brands, when we're developing effective um, lead magnets. So real sort of added value documentation, PDFs and white papers, research papers and reports, which you're going to put behind that gateway um, in need of a, a sort of a login address. Um, because what you're going to be doing is just identifying those prospects and those audiences, but also continuing to create customer value. Um, I was also working with somebody a couple of weeks ago where I was saying that you can be doing a form of lead magnet post sale. So they said, well, we've got a huge number of customers, but only a proportion are necessarily going to be in the market to, to buy again, to re-engage and X, Y, Z for a number of reasons. So we said, well, why don't we take that broad email marketing list that you've got of all those customers and then you go back in with your asset. It was for a cross-sell opportunity. So you then go back in a month later with a lead magnet. So you go back in with a, this piece of added value, this piece of collateral. It was a guide in this instance. And then you see what proportion engage with that. So of, I don't know, a thousand email addresses, do 50 click through from the email to read this particular document? Or do they you know, download it, actively download it? What you've then got is of that thousand, you know, the 50 who are going to be engaged for the cross sell. You've got that proportion of your audience. Do you then either put them through a marketing funnel with more marketing collateral or is the nature of the cross sell that the sales team can jump in and communicate with those 50? OK, and of those 50, do they expect to convert five? What you've then done is converted five of your initial thousand, but it's about how you've narrowed it down, found those prospects and converted them. It's sales and marketing working in tandem. It's a concept, but it's a concept that I was talking about with a client and that they're putting into effect. So we do need to consider um, you know, how, how we can start to really align these things with, um, in terms of lead magnets and content and where they, where they come in the, in the funnel. And of course, broadly speaking as well, content marketing, you know, blogs, blog articles, something that we're talking about doing more and more uh, on the Wagada blog, a kind of tutorials and guides and things as well, so that we can be providing customers and prospects, uh, sorry, customers, clients and prospects with more of that through a blog platform so that rather than them having to seek that information elsewhere, let's make sure that this is a strong education resource to support as well. Um, so consider what you're building into that content marketing, what you're building into that, to that blog plan. Um, and of course, perhaps one of the most important tactics when we're bringing these together is, is actually email marketing. Um, but email marketing done well, you know, and done right. I don't just mean daily communications pumped into people's inboxes and constant, did you know about this offer and that we're doing this? I mean, segmented, targeted email communications, workflows and funnels. Um, 
we are going live with one client this week on um, quite an exciting workflow for one phase out of, I think, three phases of um, of e automated email marketing communications. And those three phases are very heavily focused on pre-delivery, delivery process and post. So what we're then going to be getting after a huge amount of upfront work, let's not you know beat about the bush it, the initial work for some of this it does take the time however once that has then been implemented what you're saving in the long term is going to be incredible and the point is is then you can be creating this customer value and sending the right message to the right person at, at the right time through workflows and email um, marketing which will then align nicely with your sales process and your your sales um, timing and finally, and perhaps perhaps the most obvious of all, is going to be about prospecting and relationship building and how you do that through um, through social media channels. Um, some people may use kind of something like Sales Navigator or Recruiter Lite on, on LinkedIn, the paid for tools. If a sales department has that, that's fantastic. But if that sales department is then building out um, prospect lists and lead types and everything within that platform, they need to be able to share that with the marketing team. So the marketing team are better understanding the profile of the individuals. So not just the business, but the individuals to whom that marketing team are marketing to. Because whoever we're marketing to, even if we're marketing to, I don't know, Nike or McDonald's, um, or WH Smiths, um, we're not just marketing to those brands, we're marketing to a decision-making unit within those brands. So it might be a franchise owner at McDonald's, what does he look like? Or, you know, it might be an operations manager at WH Smith, or it might be a, um, you know, sales director or, pros or you know, um, uh, you get where I'm going with this at Nike. But the point is, we need to better understand the profiles of those individuals and not just the makeup of the brand. And that's where the two need to, to link up a little bit better to, to encourage lead generation as well. And, and then finally, you wanna bring all of this together as much as possible with, with automation. You know, Do we have automated email um, workflows? Um, not sort of automation per se, but you know, do we have an effective content calendar so that we're not just developing these collateral and these white papers kind of you know, off the cuff, are we planning ahead and thinking, you know, what comes when and, and when are we going to develop that? Um, and our social media content calendars and so on. But ultimately, what's going to bring all of this back together is understanding the customer and the client. And this is what I've just been kind of touching upon. So just to really kind of finish, I suppose, with, with more of that kind of, kind of customer focus. Um, because you need to break it down quite granularly. And what I'm seeing at the moment, and it's just something that I'm seeing, is that um, B2B businesses are not always necessarily segmenting their target market enough. So they say, well, we target, um, uh, I'm trying to think of a hypothetical example without naming a, a, a real example that I'm working on. Um, but they might target, I don't know, a, um, okay, a high, okay, they might target a high street an independent high street food retailer and they go that's the target well who you know with a check with a micro chain of 10 10 locations they say well who who are you who you know who are you selling to in that well it's often um i'm speaking to an operations manager okay and who's that operations manager working with oh well you know often they'll they'll make this there might be a finance well often the finance team are in, but and all of a sudden all this stuff starts coming out about the finance team about the um the executives that might be out there looking at opportunities about all this and suddenly we realize well actually from a sales perspective that might be your your decision maker your ultimate decision maker but are you really breaking down your decision making unit to better create that marketing collateral and it's a really simple concept but it's about breaking it down by users influencers buyers initiators deciders and gatekeepers okay that is your decision making unit sometimes that might all be one person but not always let me give you an example um kellogg's cornflakes okay um, here's a concept. Um, 
perhaps a child sees an advert on the TV and they get excited. They're the influencer. They're going to go to their parents and they're going to say, mum, dad, you know, cornflakes. Oh, it's so exciting. Look, sugary corn snacks. Can we, can, we, can we get them? Can we get them? Can we get them? Maybe dad's the gatekeeper. Maybe he's the barrier. Maybe he's in the way. Maybe he's stopping the sale going, no, nope, you've got to be careful of your teeth. You can't, you know, you shouldn't X, Y, Z. Um, but maybe mum comes in uh, and she's also an influencer saying, well, well, actually, um, you know, yeah, um, it, it, it's his birthday next week. Let's get him cornflakes for a treat. So maybe the child was the in initiator. The dad was the gatekeeper and both the child and the mum started to influence that decision. And then perhaps the decider is a shared unit in that example. It's the mother and the father. They make the decision together and they go, OK, dad's convinced. But, you know, he says to mum, can we afford it this month? We're cutting back on the weekly shop. She says, no, that's absolutely fine. In that case, they're both the decider. And then they decide. Maybe the buyer is dad. Maybe dad does the, the weekly shop. He's the only person that's going to be handing cash over to that till. He's the buyer. But maybe he'll never use it. Maybe he will never touch the cornflakes. He's gone to the supermarket. He's purchased in amongst a, a 75 pound shop, a box of Kellogg's cornflakes. Over the till he, is his face. He's never eaten them. And the child is the user. Now, in that example, the child is the initiator, the influencer and the, um, the user. The dad's the buyer. But have you at any point marketed to the dad? No, there's never been a single marketing message in that example that's gone to the dad, but he's the one that parted with the cash. So what we can do is take that. It's, an, it's a crude analogy, but, but it's, it's an example. You, you get where I'm going with this. You can take that and apply it from a marketing context. You don't always necessarily want to be marketing to the end the, 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 the purchaser. You don't always necessarily want to be marketing to the end user. If I use our organization as an example, what do you think is happening at management level? We're upselling when we see things or opportunities or platforms or tools. I'm not the person that holds the purse strings, but I might be bought into something and I might sell that internally. So a sales rep or a sales individual may never need to communicate to me directly, but maybe I'm a good opportunity to market to and I should be reached to on LinkedIn or through marketing collateral so that then when I'm having a management meeting on a monthly basis, I can say, well, look, I know we're desperate for a new design tool. I know that the budget's at this. Have we seen this? I was speaking with somebody only last week. I saw this on uh, a guide, you know, and I've upsold. So we need to start breaking that down a little bit more granularly than just purely, oh, I target this industry and the person, the purchaser um, looks, looks a, little, a little something like this. And then within that, when you've got that decision making unit, you can organize it into that sort of that pipeline or that kind of workflow. OK, and this is what I'd love to leave you with today as a bit of an activity that you can do afterwards. Um, feel free to take a screenshot. You'll get all of this. You'll get all of this sent across as well. Um, but it's a bit of an activity that will hopefully kind of bring all of this together or, or start to get you on an actionable path in terms of what, what you're doing next. So you can start to organize that pipeline to think about cold caller or qualified lead. You know, who's the main stakeholder? So again, in that Kellogg's example, who are the main people? Um, maybe it's the son. Uh, maybe the son in that example is the main, the main person, you know. Uh, but who's the main stakeholder that you need to convince or, you know, uh, that you need to perhaps be uh, putting more of your sales or marketing effort into? And, of course, what's the anticipated lead time? Again, in that quite sort of crude Kellogg's analogy, the lead time might be four days from the point that the child saw the advert and discovered Kellogg's for the first time in, on a kid's TV show to when the dad did a weekly shop on a Wednesday. So... Alternatively, it might be six months, you know, in, an, in a different um, context. But think about all of that and what that looks like. And then what you can do is start to jot that down. So feel free to screenshot or take a quick photo of this. But again, I'll get all of the clash will sent over to you today. So you will have all of this. But jot down the stakeholders in your decision making unit. So go away and jot down who is the person in, and you might have to do it industry vertical by industry vertical. Who's the main person 
you know, uh, who's who's the initiator, should we say? Who's the first person to, to get involved? Who's the gatekeeper? You know, who's the barrier? Who's the biggest uh, influencer? Who are the people that, that most influence that decision? And ultimately, who's the buyer? You know, who holds the purse strings? Who's, who's in charge of the cash? Then start to jot down their characteristics and habits. OK, so in this instance, in Kellogg's again, what are the characteristics and habits? Well, maybe the child is... Um, um, you know, is 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 a is is an early adopter. Likes to try new things. Likes to try things for the first time. Perhaps they're uh, they they they've got a sweet tooth. They're into you know those kind of flavors, so on and so forth. Perhaps the father's characteristics are that he's more conscientious or or you know planning ahead. Perhaps the parental characteristics are that they're money conscious, family focused. You know, think of all these things that make up that decision making that decision making unit, and then start to identify which marketing and sales tactics will be utilized for each. So, you know, in that example, I'm just going to stick with it for, for the analogy. Uh, so bear with me. Um, uh, but, you know, in that example, perhaps the marketing tactics for the child are television adverts, uh, newspaper adverts, you know, so on and so forth, social media advertising. So that, that is, you know, seen through that kind of marketing um, collateral. However, perhaps there's a whole piece at the Tesco store, which is that nice big yellow label that says we match priced Asda on our Kellogg's, which is going to convince the dad in that moment to to make the purchase. You know, think about what marketing and sales tactics are actually because they're there they're all around us and they are targeting different segments because that lovely we price matched asda means nothing to the child absolutely nothing to the child in that in that in that example but it means everything to the parent that may have reached for the own brand in that moment but then saw that actually they price matched asda there was a sale on oh okay we will go kellogg's and the kid really wanted it they're all marketing um tactics but they apply to different members of the decision making unit and then, you know, start to jot down which department will be most engaged with those. So where is it marketing um, and where is it, you know, where is it sales? Um, perhaps Kellogg's have got a massive push on. And when the dad walks through the supermarket doors, there's the taste testing at the front with the little cups and the person handing out vouchers and convincing you where you need to go to, you know, um, to grab that off the shelf. Um, and that would be a sales focus. So, you know, Again, that's like it's a B2C context, but you get the idea of how we need to not think about these tactics as mass messaging and mass marketing, but we need to start segmenting um, more and more. So just to think about that model again, you know, from initiator through to influencer, to buyers, to deciders, to gatekeepers, to users. And I'd almost love to see on a, on a piece of paper or something that jotted out with those lovely lines and then little scribbles about who that user is what's their name what do they look like i'm working with a, with a client where we're, we're targeting a, a certain type of business owner and that business owner's got a name you know that persona we know her name we know her lifestyle habits we know what she has for breakfast and it doesn't matter that we're not talking about those things in marketing collateral it's about understanding them inside out so that from a marketing and sales perspective we're able to deliver them the right message and turn that prospect that cold customer into a lead and ultimately to to generate a return on that fab which brings me to having just over five minutes left so it's a one hour session this one um so i'm just going to open it up so that if anybody had any questions do feel free to either pop them in the chat or unmute or alternatively as i say if you want to message me privately or send anything over afterwards i'll be more than happy to oblige um so does anybody have any questions Speak now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> no, no problem at all. That's absolutely fine. Well, listen, I hope that this session was beneficial. Um, do keep an eye out. We'll be sending through, uh, has given me lots to think about with segmenting. Questions may follow once I have a go at jotting down. No problem, Alice. Do feel free to reach out to me on, on LinkedIn, as I say, or, or, or on any other platform, and, and we can chat about that. But no, do think about your segmentation. That's one of the key things to bring away from today. Segmentation and removing that blame game and, and working together in, in, um, in collaboration. Um, 
fab no problem matt glad you found it to be beneficial um yeah, as I say, I will get a recording sent over to everybody. You'll also get a version of the slides, the deck sent across to you as well. Um, don't hesitate to reach out and connect. We'll be having another session next month. You'll be getting all the details of that through uh, today as well. And then we look forward to seeing you again. But in the meantime, good luck and start to get those marketing and sales tactics working together again. Thanks very much. Have a great day.